I worked in Alaska for a bit as a member of the park services. One day, we had gotten a call about some illegal dumping on one of the local trails. So myself and another employee went out to investigate. We were fairly deep into the trails. Not too many people around except for a few joggers. When we came around a turn in the path, as we were walking, my partner looked into the woods and said, What the fuck? There's a guy there. About 20 yards away, there was a white guy with longish hair crouched behind a bush, just kind of staring at us. The man noticed that we had noticed him, and he immediately stood up and stretched out his arms in the air, like he was just enjoying the day. He actually approached us, and it turns out that the man I was with actually knew the man in the woods. He was a local builder, or owned a construction company. In fact, he had built a deck for my friend the year prior. After they said their hellos, he mentioned that he just stepped off the path for a moment to take a leak. It was kind of strange, though, because we had seen him. That definitely wasn't what he was doing. But he wasn't that suspicious and my friend knew him. So, after making sure he wasn't illegally dumping anything, we started walking back, and he walked with us for a while. A few years later, I heard that the man we had seen had been arrested. Apparently, where there had been some sort of altercation with a girl at a coffee shop, or so I had initially been told. And he shot her in a robbery and was under arrest for murder. The truth was even more bizarre. The man, Israel K.S., was a serial killer who had actually abducted, tortured, and murdered the girl. After being arrested, it turns out that he had been traveling around the country, murdering random people for years. He would bury murder kits and come back, sometimes years later, to dig them up. They would include guns, cash, etc., whatever he needed. I went back later to where we had come across Israel in the woods to see if there was any such a kit buried there, but I didn't find anything. Others suggested that he might have been waiting to surprise a victim on the trail, but that didn't seem to be his general MO, as was my understanding anyway. Our encounter is something I've totally been able to explain, and since he's killed himself before trial, I likely never will have all the answers though. I've worked as a pack trip outfitter, ranch hand in the middle of a national forest, and spend at least a week each month camping. I'm doing dog mushing now, so I'm outdoors now in times when it's colder and darker and further into places that people don't often go. My story is a two-parter, with the first part being just past the New Mexico border into Arizona. Anyways, I see five or six elk cows burst onto the road and I slam on the brakes and swerve all the way off the shoulder of the road, but I can still almost hit one elk that was bigger than the rest. It looked like it was going to hit me straight on and crash into the front of my window, killing me. Like I heard something happen to a guy with a horse earlier that year. I felt this really calm feeling, and I felt like that would be the end. Everything fell slow, and I got a good look at it. It was the size of a moose, but it had no antlers of any kind, in the build of a typical cow. Cow isn't a female moose. The other animals were typical elk cows, but this one was larger and covered from head to toe in what looked like to be large gray wool, like an angora goat that needed shaving so bad that it starts to almost look like dreadlocks. Luckily, I get past it and see its head go over the roof of my shitty Ford Taurus. This is the moment I remember best, because for just an instant, before its head went over the roof, I felt like it could see me, and it knew that I was looking at it, even though its eyes were covered in thick gray wool, and it hit the back of my car. My bumper had a new dent, but by the time I got out of the car and to see if it was good, it went into the brush. My friends think it was some kind of Sasquatch, even though it was certainly a small-footed quadruped and called it a Bigfoot Taurus. My wife says it was probably the spirit of death, and that I died there, but I continue living on what my mind wants to happen. The second part is that I was a few miles off the ridge that overlooks Strawberry in Utah, and I got this old aspen grove, with this really thick aspen on both sides. I mention this because with a string of 12 dogs behind an ATV, 
There wasn't enough snow for sleds. There really was nowhere to go but forward. You couldn't guide the dogs through trees like that, so it was always forward till we got to the end and then we would loop, and that would bring us back on the trail to take us back to base camp. Which was an exciting thought because I'm using just a headlamp and it was late and cold. And then I saw it again, running on my left side, in the same direction as us but also towards us. I wish I would have grabbed a camera, but imagine the franticness of watching my dogs to make sure they didn't chase towards it or head off the wrong way. In dog mushing, you can never take your eyes off the leaders too long or something can go wrong, and to stop the team it would make their shore to go toward it and caught in the trees, so really the best thing to do was to go faster. Keep the dogs busy so they don't chase it. So I'm just looking at it, at the pack leader, ahead of the team. A fallen tree or a cattle guard taken too fast can injure a dog just like a moose. At the creature, then reaching around in my emergency bag, back at the leaders and pull out my just-in-case gun. I click off the first two chambers, I keep empty. I have the gun pointed straight up in the air, and live ammo is ready to go. I really didn't want to shoot it, or even frighten the dogs with a gunshot, but it keeps getting close, so I fired a shot a few feet above it, and I hear it hit some branches. Then I look back at the dogs to see if they were continuing to be good. They were stuck in a thick growth of trees. I kept looking around, but that was the last I saw of it. Although the rest of the ride, I was jumping at shadows. Pretty crazy, but the craziest thing as that tiny moment though is, oh shit, it's death again. But this time he's going to take me for real. I'm a park ranger here, and here's a personal story of mine that was pretty creepy. Me and my ex-girlfriend decided to have a date night, since we both had the day off of work. So, we did the usual dinner and a movie thing, and afterwards we decided we would go for a midnight drive. So, we drive about an hour and a half out of town going nowhere particular. We just knew that we were going to get it on under the stars. After scoping out a random dirt road, I took my truck down it and parked in an open off to the side next to the forest. The entire area was surrounded by forest. After about 10 minutes of kissing, we decided to get down to business. So we get in the back seat and start tearing each other's clothes off. After about 5 minutes, headlights. Headlights are heading towards where we are, but not directly at us. So we are both rushing in an attempt to get our clothes back on thinking for some reason it might be the cops, which makes absolutely no sense now. My pants are nowhere to be found and either is her shirt. Now, keep in mind, the closest house to the road we were on is probably 30 minutes away. We kept fumbling looking for our clothing and eventually found it and struggled to get them back on. The truck keeps getting closer and closer, but like I said, not directly at us, until we finally realize it's not somebody coming to yell at us off their property or the cops. In fact, they can't even tell where we are because my truck is black and I'm parked almost in the thickest part of the forest area. Finally, an old beat up F-150 parks his truck about 50 feet from us, leaves his truck running and gets out. He walks out to his truck bed, grabs his shovel, and starts digging into the ground. He did this for a good 30 to 40 minutes while we just sat there in silence. Afraid to move or speak on the off chance he hears us, he stops digging and lifts something out of the ground. It's a decent sized object, but it was too dark to see exactly what it was. He picks it up, places it in the truck of his bed, and goes back for the shovel, and places it in the trunk bed as well, and drives off into the night. Me and my girlfriend decide that it's best to wait another 20 minutes before we start the truck. To this day, I have no idea what that could have been, but I really hope at the worst it was drugs. Last summer, I had the amazing experience of working and leading tours in the longest cave in the world. After working there for a few weeks, I started hearing stories of some of the other rangers experiences. I will share them in the future if I get their okay. Mammoth Cave has a long history of paranormal experiences. It is the place that inspired HP Lovecraft to write The Beast in the Cave 
and I have personally met rangers who have seen full body apparitions, had orbs that have flown around Taurus, and have been forcefully shoved to the ground while leading Taurus. My first experience happened just a few weeks into the job. I was trailing our most popular tour, the historic tour, and we had just made it to the second stop of the tour at Giant's Coffin. This is a place that a lot of rangers, including myself, like to turn out the lights and show the tourists total darkness. It is also known to rangers as a paranormal hotspot. As I said, I was trailing the tour, which means I was at the back, just watching over the tour. The tour was well behaved, and I was just sitting there enjoying the darkness. It is kind of peaceful. As I was looking back the way we have came from, down an area as known as Broadway, there's a place also down there called Cyclops Gateway. I saw a light. It was a bright light. It was like a pinprick of light. Of course, I thought I was just seeing things, so I held my hand up, thinking that if it was in my head, I should not be able to block it out with my hand. Surprisingly though, I was, and I just looked at it until the lights came back on, and before the group moved on, I went and looked where it had been. It was just a rock with nothing on it to reflect any light. I do not have any explanation for this. I have seen this phenomenon one, one other time in another room known as the Methodist Church, another known hotspot. At about a month after this, this happened, I was talking with someone and they all of a sudden pointed to Coffin's Corner. And when I told some of the veterans, they were not surprised in the slightest. Now, my next experience happened several months later. I was leading a different tour, the Mammoth Passage Tour, and I led the group back to a room known as Raffinesque Hall. On the tour, I would turn the lights out there and tell the story of Charles Harvey. It is a very old story dating back to the 1800s of a man who got lost in Mammoth Cave for 39 hours. I won't go into the whole thing, back the short version is though, that he forgets his hat and goes back in to get it. He gets lost trying to rejoin his tour group and eventually his light goes out. So he sits in total darkness and silence. He starts to go mad and starts banging rocks together. It's because the rocks banging that he is found and rescued. Now when I finish the story and turn the lights back on, I am taking a few questions. Then back down the passageway we hear knocks banging together. Now I knew that my trailing ranger was back down there controlling the light switch and I thought he was doing it. So I played it off as a joke saying it could be the ghost of Charles, still lost in the cave. On the way back out of the cave, I asked him about the rocks and he said I thought you were banging them together. I later found out that he was about 100 feet down outside the passageway looking at old signatures on the wall when he heard it too, coming from back where we were. He has had his own experiences and I trust that he was not pulling a prank. Now, if I have piqued your interest in Mammoth Cave, go and visit. Ask the rangers if they've had any experiences. They might just tell you a story. If you want to go to the most haunted areas of the cave, come and visit during the summer and take the Violet City Lantern Tour. You get to walk by the tuberculosis hits where people withered away in the cave, hoping to be cured, and where they found a 2,000 year old Native American mummy who was crushed under a fallen rock. I'm a park ecologist. I was in the middle of a wilderness area. Some stupid grad student tossed up some hobo units in a Campbell data logger and didn't get a permit. Cue me walking 30 miles to yank them out. One of the most remote areas in the lower 48 of the US. Now, most of this area, even the non-wilderness, didn't even have radio repeaters. Really remote for someone who works in places like that on the regular. I rode in helicopters fairly often, I'd say where but I think that might dox me. Anyway, we came across a gathering of about 100 ultralight aircraft and paraplanes, a dozen jeeps, in the middle of a fucking wilderness area, partying beer the whole nine yards. I was pissed. The ranger got his butt out there and wrote a whole lot of tickets. Another time, I was doing a survey or a clearance along a river in the desert. I had to take a deuce like a mofo. I was holding it because I was getting near town where they were dropping off our truck. It was only about 5 more miles but I was prairie dogging it. I came around a bend and someone had a pipe dumping raw sewage into the drainage. Well, fuck it. 
I shit in the wash. A great big rock hard dehydration poop. A couple of days later my boss called me and my co-walker into his office. It was just us three. A guy in the fire crew had found a giant turd in the wash next to his father-in-law's house and wanted to know what it was from. He thought a mountain lion. My work of art was sitting in a ziplock on my boss's desk in a federal office. Word got around about that one. Years later in school, I mentioned that I worked in this office and location to someone who had worked at an AK, and they said at the same time they asked me if I knew the guy who the shit in the wash was. Now, I leave a little indication that it was a human, like some TP. I'm a park ranger, but I've never really experienced anything creepy while being one. But when I was 13, I was at my grandfather's hunting camp. My uncle had just bought a new hunting camera and wanted to test it out, so we set it up in the woods. I got the brilliant idea to go up in the woods with my two other cousins and moon it. So when he checked the card, instead of wildlife, he would see some ass cheeks. Hilarious to a 13 year old's mind, and after some convincing, my other two cousins were in. But we had to go over the counter of darkness. So we set our alarms at 3am and pass out. By 3.15, we all sneak outside, throw on our headlamps and start walking. We know the camera is about a mile away. The trail goes over two pretty big hills, and the camera is in a valley on the far side of the second hill. We start walking as normal, and everything is good. The excitement starts building, and we're pretty giddy that we're pulling off this glorious prank. After a few minutes of brisk walking, we get to the top of the second hill. My older cousin knows the area more than me stops as he gets to the top. As I make my way to the top, I see why. Off in the distance, about 400 yards, is a spotlight. It's bluish and white in color, and it illuminates nearly half the hill at this point. This thing was crazy bright. By this time, all three of us were looking at the light, and my older cousin tells us to turn off our headlamps. We stand there in silence. Me being the 13 year old pussy I was, started to get freaked out. Aliens is the first thing that comes to mind, and I tell him we have to leave. I turn on my headlamp and turn around and about to head back to the campsite. As soon as I turn my lights back on, the super bright blue light starts slowly to turn and stops right on us. No bobbing or movement from the light besides, besides just a slow, consistent, not pan over us. At that point, I nope out with my cousins right behind. I get inside and go straight to bed, pretty much freaking out. Flash forward to the next morning and all three of us go back to the same spot and then proceeded to go out where we thought the light would have been and there was nothing there. No boot marks, no lights, no nothing. To this day, we still have no idea. I had been out stargazing and was sleeping out in a park near town. No tent, just a sleeping bag and a pad. This was a fairly popular area for joggers, walkers, etc. I have found a nice spot in a field a few hundred meters from the top, obscured by tall grass and brush with a nice view of the valley below and mountains in the distance. It was very nice and saw some shooting stars. We heard some coyotes singing in the distance and slept very well since it was a warm summer night. In the morning, at the crack of dawn, I was woken up by one of the strangest performances I have ever witnessed. Above me on the hill, I could hear some kind of chanting. Due to my concealed location, I couldn't actually see what was going on, and I wasn't keen on moving to a better vantage point, lest I be seen by the group. A man's loud and deep voice was half chanting, half shouting in a language I couldn't identify. It sounded like Latin derived language and was definitely not Spanish, although he kept repeating a word which sounded familiar to Diablo, Spanish for the devil. There were the other voices too, but he was clearly leading whatever was happening up there. Eventually, he finished his chant or shout. There were some cheers and whoops and the entire group silently departed. After waiting a while to make sure it was clear, I went up to where I heard the sound coming from. There was no physical evidence of whatever had happened. 
I asked everybody I knew in town if they had any idea what it might have possibly been, and nobody had heard anything like it. To this day, one of my greatest regrets is not peeking out of the side of my hiding spot to see what the heck was going on. From what I can tell, there was supposed to be a meteor shower that night, which is why we had been there. This was on the way to Willamette Valley in Oregon, and only about a 30 minute walk from a trailhead itself, maybe a 10 minute drive from town. Not a particularly remote place, nor a place of any particular native significance as far as I know. If anyone can figure out what that was, I'd be quite amazed. This was an estate wilderness area in the northeast, and nestled between uninterrupted miles of mountains, pine forests, streams, and no vehicle access. Only rocky footpaths with extra large rocks every once in a while in the beginning to blog out the possibility of a car or ATV or bike showing up. A road 2-3 to three miles away, but 10 miles to the next real road with traffic. About 7 miles to where houses start, but 10 miles to a real road with more than the occasional building, and 20 miles from any sort of town. Most of the oddities have been tree structures. One was a low teepee type structure of about 6 logs, that was off trail about a 2 hour walk from a small dirt that you can dump your car. My thought is someone had a tent frame out of logs and camped there. It was cool, deep into the far inner side of the wilderness. I've seen a long branches of mini logs stacked horizontally about 5 to 6 off the ground as well. I've also seen two trees next to each other that both fell over, but they still had their roots in, forming a big X. But the weirdest one was the jungle gym or high bar type thing. It was off a path, also about 2 hours down and up around a footpath that was very deep in parts where you had to hold on or risk falling backwards off the rocks. So, I don't see how someone could have carried any tool or ladder to do this. There were thick woods and very few fallen rocks, so I don't see how someone could have carried in any other tool to do this. Maybe it was a mini tornado, but six of them didn't really fall, they were pushed if that makes sense. It's like they were pushed in to make a structure, like you would hang a pig over a fire with or make a tent frame. There was a log with brush on it anchoring three logs together on the side, and it landed perfectly on the other end and rigged it into one knob on the living tree to its right. I jumped up and hung from it, but it didn't budge, and it held my weight fine and I weigh 185 pounds. The more I inspected it, the more I came to the conclusion that it was made. The log across the top was perfectly horizontal. A fallen branch can't get wedged in perfectly and on a perfectly horizontal line like that. That's not how branches fall, but more importantly, the log running across the top looks like it was broken off by the healthy, longer tree pushed down that it was resting on, but then it should not have fallen about 10 feet to the right and facing to the opposite direction. A tree gradually dipping down because its root system is muddy in soil doesn't fall the type of force that thrusts a tree on top of another one and to fling it 5 feet towards. So, I'm not sure what's making these. I have a lot of friends thinking that it might be Bigfoot or Sasquatch or something along those lines. What do you think? I'll tell you something weird that happened. Last year, me and a few friends were up at Mount St. Helens going for a snowmobile ride. It had recently snowed 3 feet, so we decided to go up for an evening ride. Well, when we got there, it was apparent that no one else had been up there riding, snowshoeing, or cross-country skiing since there were no tracks in the snow. The area we were riding into was next to the Clearwater Canyon on the 25 road. Anyhow, we took off that evening heading out all to the side roads having fun and cruising around. After a few hours of riding back, we went back to the truck for some food with the bright starlit full moon night we decided to go out for one last night ride, which was pushing 8.30 in the evening. Well, 
The four of us proceeded back up to the 25 along the Clearwater Canyon when we noticed lights down in the canyon, occasionally flickering on and off. After stopping for a few minutes and looking down into the canyon, we could not identify what it was. The weird thing was, there is no way to get into the Clearwater Canyon unless you walk the three miles in, and there are no public roads that pass through it. After watching the lights, it looked like there was machinery or something working down there, but none of the lights made sense. It sort of freaked us out a bit, so we decided to get out of there. I was on the lead bike, so we all started our snowmobiles up and headed back towards the truck. We didn't realize that Chad had gotten stuck and was left behind. Well, when we got back to the truck, he was freaked. I'm talking so freaked that he was shaking and really weirded out. Chad's been my best friend since we were seven years old, and he's never in our friendship acted as if he were scared of anything. Well, Chad went on to say that we need to hurry up and load up and get out of here, and screaming that there's something up with a super bright light and it was coming for me on foot. Well, I guess when Chad had his snowmobile stuck, this thing, or human, came up out of the canyon towards him, and by the time he finally got to the snow machine running and unstuck, it was 20 yards away or so, pointing the light right in his face. To this day, we still never figured out what or who would have been that far off any road in the canyon with three to five feet of snow around. We still can't figure out why someone would be walking out of the canyon, which was two to three miles from the bottom, to where we were at 9.30 to 10 p.m. at night. The only thing we can think of is they might have been doing some military training in the canyon. Anyone have a clue what it might have been? In 1991, I was hunting the Tiaga unit and shot a four point at about 200 yards down a steep ravine. He was just up from the bottom on the other side, so I took the shot because there was a flat hike out following the bottom of the ravine to a road three miles away. No way I could pack the deer up and make that hike out there. It was a chore to say the least. But it was a clear shot and I dropped him. Later to find out that it was a non-lethal hit, but the deer slipped and broke its neck. A whole nother story. Anyway, I had a very early Elkhorn Handle Gerber folding blade knife in a leather case of my belt. My grandfather had given it to my dad years before, and my dad gave it to me. As I was sliding down the ravine to retrieve the deer, I followed a short blood trail that located the deer, went to grab my knife and gut it for the hike out but the knife was gone, the sheath open and full of dirt. Not only was I mad because I had to make a decision to leave the deer until I could get a knife back to where it was or pack it out whole. After looking around a bit for the knife, I sacrificed my Tasco scope and broke out a piece of glass in the front and rock to use it as a knife. It took me about two hours to cut with fingers to gut the deer to the piece of glass. I broke the ribs open, tore my t-shirt into strips, and made a backpack out of the carcass, and packed it out. What a nightmare. When I got home, my father told me he got a call from my grandmother, said she had died of a heart attack earlier that day. I didn't tell my dad I lost a knife. I just took a quick shower and went back down to the ravine, retracing every step looking for the knife. When I got to the bottom, I had not found the knife. It was getting dark and I had a long hike out with a flashlight. I propped myself up against a rocky ledge and had tears in my eyes about my grandfather's passing. I wiped my eyes and looked down at my feet and saw that I more or less hoped was a tiny point sticking out of the sand. I brushed the sand aside from my foot and there was the knife. The sad part is, a few years later my dad mailed me the knife to my P.O. box in Reedsport, but he put the wrong box number on it. The postmaster refused to give me the name of the person who had the box, but later asked if they got a knife in the mail, and they denied it. I'm usually a lone man adventurer, especially when it comes to hiking, because my friends are pretty inactive people. So whenever I take them hiking, they usually slow me down. So, one Saturday afternoon, I decided to go hiking, even though it was about 2pm already. I've hiked the same trail plenty of times, but only in the early morning. So, knowing the length of this trail, I knew that by the time I finished, it would be close to sunset. The trail was about a 9 mile, 
round trip from a steady incline coming back up. From the trailhead to about halfway, the trail runs through a thick covered forest and a remaining of the trail runs along the side of an exposed mountain. Even at the peak of the sun, light barely penetrates the thick treetops of the forest. So when I started the trail, I passed a few hikers who were coming back. But realizing that I was maybe one of the few people who were still on the trail, I sped up to pace to make sure I finished before sunset. Everything went fine while hiking as I powered through the trail fairly fast. Getting to the end, taking a quick 5 minute break and then turning around. By the time I was halfway, it was about 4pm. The whole way back I was alone on the trail coming, since I passed a few people who already made the turn around. The sun was already starting to hide behind some of the mountains and the forest was already really dark. So I powered my way up the incline. The whole way, there was not a living soul on the trail besides me. I was already kind of creeped out being by myself on this trail, so I just listened to music and tried not to pay attention to anything else but the trail. As I was walking, I saw a black mass, about the size of maybe a rabbit or a skunk, run across the trail. It definitely wasn't an animal because it was too fast and there was no defining color, shape, or anything. It was just a mass. It freaked me out a little bit, so I started to jog the trail. The whole time, I can see the light dwindling and it was getting darker by the second. As I was jogging, I just had the feeling something or someone was following me. I knew no one was behind me because the whole trip back it was just me on the trail. I pulled out my pocket knife that I always carried with me just in case I had to shank something or someone. About halfway through the forest, I grew tired of jogging, so I decided just to walk but keep a fast pace. As I slowed down, I had the urge to look back and I did. I took a look over my shoulder a few times. I kept a fast pace walking and for about a good half mile or so I was close to the trailhead when I decided to look over my shoulder again. When I did. I saw a human-like black mass, trailing behind me about 30 or so feet behind. This mass had a definitive head and upper body shape, but anything below the waist was just a black mass. As soon as I noticed this mass, just in the blink of an eye, it darted into the trees. Of course, scaring the hell out of me. I darted for the trailhead. Thankfully, I was closer than I expected and never was so happy to see sunlight in my car. I was running so fast to my car that I didn't even realize that there were still people in the parking lot at the trailhead who were getting ready to leave as well until I was sitting in my car shaking and trying to get myself together before I drove off. I haven't gone hiking since that day and it's been over two months. I did a little research on the trail and the trail used to be a travel place for gold mining towns. It was forgotten for almost 100 years until it was retraced in 1980. This experience happened to me while camping in the wilderness of eastern Washington near the Canadian border. Two friends and myself were sitting around the campfire. We were camped on a large flat about midway up the mountain we were hiking. All of a sudden, we heard a strange screaming noise. The screams were shrill and came in consecutive one to two second bursts. Here's my attempt to describe the noise. It was something like, Arrah! Arrah! The noise was getting closer, and I asked my more wilderness experienced friend if it could possibly be a predator. I know mountain cats can make screaming noises. He said he didn't think so, but we grabbed our rifles. The noise is getting closer, and we can see an animal coming towards us straight up the fairly steep grade of mountain at the fast pace. I would clock the speed at 25 miles per hour easily. It was about the speed of someone on a motorbike going at a fast rate. We grabbed our rifles and took aim as the animal bolted straight towards our campsite. But what we saw next was not a predator. It was a deer, bounding in huge leaps, screaming entirely on his hind legs. This deer was hopping like a pogo stick with his forelegs held in front of it. The look of pure terror in his eyes reflected in the firelight will haunt me forever. I've looked for video of deers on their hind legs and such behavior, 
but I've only ever seen deers getting food out of trees or possibly fighting another deer on their hind legs. My friends joke and say the deer got into some bad mushrooms, but it was truly the strangest experience in my entire life. I had an interesting experience while camping with my husband a couple of weeks ago. It was a nice driving campsite, a corner spot next to some other campsites and woods on the other three sides. We had a nice day hiking, cooked some fajitas and s'mores over the fire, and then we settled into our tent to sleep. Later that night, I woke up and heard a weird noise. It sounded kind of like an electronic tone. Then, I heard what sounded like people talking right outside of the tent. They better get out of there. I saw an opossum go in there. Thinking that there were other campers around walking around, I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. A couple of minutes later, I heard the strange tone noise again, and then what sounded like a cat meowing and walking around the tent. It sounded like my cat when he wants to be let into the house. I'm not about to let strange animals into my tent, so I just lay there and it stopped after about a minute. A couple of minutes later, I heard the tone once again, then I heard a lower, gravelly voice talking outside the tent. They better get out of there before I get them. All of this happened over the course of maybe 10 minutes. I didn't react as strongly as I possibly should have, but I was tired and thought at first it might be some kind of dream. My husband got up and left the tent to use the bathroom a little while later. He hadn't heard anything and I didn't hear anything else after that. The next morning, while eating breakfast, I could hear the neighbor campers talking. One of their children, five to seven years old at least, was upset with his brother because they heard some noise telling them to get out of the camper last night, and now his brother was denying that he heard anything. I'm not sure what exactly happened that night, but it was definitely creepy and interesting. It was the beginning of summer. My darling husband Jay and I were going camping at my favorite place in the whole world. This was a wilderness campground with a crystal clear lake and hiking trails, a river for canoeing, fishing, etc. This was going to be a special weekend where we leave the kids, careers and all behind for just some time for the two of us in nature. It was a Saturday morning and Jay had to work. So it was a little late before we could leave we got to the place we were going, and there was only two of us, so we set up our tents and all that, and got done some hiking, had a picnic at the waterfall, etc. Later, we came back to camp. We built a fire and shared a bottle of wine, till the darkness and firefly set in. It was a full moon and everything was beautiful. I got this brilliant idea to do something that I haven't done in many years. I wanted to go skinny dipping in the lake. Well. Jay had already drank too much and he was really tired from having to work earlier that day and all the hiking didn't help him any, so he didn't want to go. Also, there was no one camping except for the two of us. If there had been, I wouldn't have gone, at least not skinny dipping, but I felt grimy and sweaty and just was not going to be able to sleep without cleaning up. So Jay decides to lie down and rest in the tent and I take off down the moonlit trail. My beach bag loaded with biodegradable soap and shampoo. Change of clothes and other bath items. While walking down to the lake, my spidey senses kind of picked up on something. I ignored it though. Once I got there, I undressed, put my clothes on the root of a big pine tree and dove in. I bathed, swam, and enjoyed the relaxation. It was almost like a trip to the spa for me. Finally, I got out. I was standing on the shore getting dressed, and I had that funny little growing feeling, like when you were being watched. My concern was not a person. This time of the year we had not seen a soul all day long and no one lived close by. My concern was that there could be a bear or some other wild animal. Just to describe the lake, the lake kind of sits in a bowl. There is a cliff, but it is not a steep cliff. It slopes. There are trees and forest around it. This is relevant. So. While getting dressed, I looked up toward the cliff, and my heart felt like it was about to stop. A person stepped out of the shadows of the trees. 
just from his silhouette, I couldn't see his face, I thought it was Jay. Maybe he changed his mind about swimming, which was unlikely since when he goes to sleep, he sleeps like a log. Or maybe he was worried about me. I had been enjoying the lake so much that I had been there for probably an hour. So just assuming it was him, I just started joking with him. Sorry, but you just missed a great swim, or something dumb like that. Normally he would joke back with me or say something grumpy if he was irritated that I had been down there too long, but he didn't say anything. All the while I'm pulling on my clothes, still talking to him, but he never said a word. When I had all my clothes on and was ready to start walking back, he stepped back into the shadows of the forest. And at that point, I was pretty sure it wasn't Jay, so I grabbed my stuff and ran down the trail as fast as I could. One time, I thought I heard voices, but I was so scared I may have imagined it. I got back and Jay of course was sound asleep. I was ready to pack up and go home and thoroughly creeped out, but he was sleeping and I didn't want to get him up. I didn't sleep at all that night, and so he got up the next morning to make coffee. Every noise I heard during the night, I thought it was whoever that guy was who had been watching me again. Jay was very upset and scared for me when I told him what happened, and we hiked to the place where I saw the guy standing. There were two sets of footprints there, and from what I could tell, he had probably been there a while. That was one of the scariest experiences I've ever had. I think about how vulnerable I was in the lake that night, and still creeped out that some guy was just watching me swim and watching me get dressed. A couple of years ago, I went hiking alone on different trails in the Blue Ridge Parkway. For some reason, I thought it would be okay for a 20-something woman to go alone. Stupid, I know. I always visited Mount Mitchell, so I made the trek up there. This was on a Monday, so there weren't a ton of visitors. The path to the summit is paved, so it is fairly easy to walk, but it is a bit steep. I was a smoker at the time, so I was quite out of breath. I finally got to the top and stood to the side trying to catch my breath and I see someone very close to me out of the corner of my eye. I look up and it's a man, probably in his late 40s, greasy and dark brown hair. He says, Hey, I noticed you took a while to get up here and you're breathing really hard. Are you okay? I was kind of taken back, but I replied saying I was fine and that I'm a smoker and I kind of laughed to make light of the situation. He stood there looking at me, so I made a little nod to let him know that I was going to walk away. I walked over to the podiums that show you the direction you're looking and what mountains and cities are the way in that distance. He followed me. He started talking out of nowhere about how he had recently been divorced and was part of a men's group that traveled around the country to lots of famous tourist spots. He asked me where I was from and I told him. He proceeded to tell me really intimate details of why he got divorced. He told me how he suspected his wife was cheating on him, so he hid in the closet one night and caught her and a co-worker in bed together. He grumbled. They both paid dearly for that night. I tried to make it visibly obvious that I was uncomfortable, but he kept talking and asking me questions without pausing to let me answer. I came to the conclusion that he was simply lonely and wanted someone to talk to. Then I realized there was no one else with this man the entire time, and I hadn't noticed any men's group, but maybe they split up and went their own separate ways for a while. At any rate, I became increasingly more nervous so I let him know that I was going to head back down to the gift shop. Again, he started following me. There were lots of trails that branch off from the main path to the summit, but I wasn't interested in going on any of those since it was, it was not very safe with this guy following me. I wasn't walking with the man now, but he was following me. He called to me loudly, Hey! I turned around and he was grinning ear to ear. His hair somehow looked even greasier. He said, why don't we go walking on one of these trails? I could show you a really good time. I replied, no thank you, sternly. I looked to my left and there were two elderly women sitting on a bench. I realized they had been watching us. One of the women called to the man, I think it's time you let the young lady get going now. I gave her a soft smile and a nod. I turned around and walked at a brisk pace down the path, passing the gift shop, going straight to my car. The man hadn't followed me. That was my last hike of the day and I'm glad that nothing uh, worse happened to me that day while I was alone. I definitely won't go on outings like that by myself anymore.
I went camping with three of my buddies, John, Bennett, and Kyle. We do this every year. It's kind of a bro trip to reconnect with each other. We were all fresh out of college and decided to go to our yearly camping trip in August. We are from Oregon and ended up camping in the woods there like we usually do at the same point. The first day was great. We set up our spot, explored the area, and by the time the sun was setting, we set up a campfire and made dinner. After a few too many beers and some s'mores, we decided to go to sleep. It was a perfect way to end the day. Our second day was basically the same thing. Hiking, food, one too many beers. But this night, we ended up being not so perfect. I remember watching some videos on YouTube. And we were laughing and it was interesting. As we finished the rest of the beers, we were wrestling around with each other like guys do, and John stopped messing around and froze. Everyone was confused, but John claimed he heard something nearby. I told him it was most likely a squirrel, and he said, no, it was most definitely not. He was scaring me at this point, and I decided to resume the tackling session, and I took him down. We forgot about the whole thing until about 10 minutes later. We were tired from wrestling and joking around, so we decided to put the fire out and head into the tent. We had a six-person tent for anybody wondering, so we were all in one tent. Just as our only light source besides our flashlights went out, I heard a slight cackle. I assume it was one of those boys because we were all clearly a bit buzzed, so everything is fine. I wanted to see what was so funny, so I turned the flashlight directly into Bennett's face. I thought he was the one laughing. Bennett's face was white as a ghost. He looked at me and said, Did you guys hear that? I said, the laughing? And Kyle said, that wasn't you. We were all shaken and decided to go into the tent, silent. As we got into the tent, I pulled out an axe that I used to cut the wood. It was the only source of protection we had. I was on the very end of the tent with Kyle and John, and in the middle was Bennett. We were all silent, but... I knew we were all wide awake after hearing the laughing. We weren't exactly at an actual campsite, where there were other people around. We just walked into the woods, found an open spot and set up camp here. We were about a mile from our car with barely any cell signal, so I guess you could say we weren't exactly in the safest position if there was a crazy maniac around. I got tired, so I dozed off. I have no idea how long I was sleeping before I heard laughing again. It's hard to describe other than it sounded menacing. It was frozen, and I didn't move. I didn't even try to look over to see if my buddies were awake. The axe was under my pillow. As I mustered enough strength to move to get the axe, I saw what looked like someone's finger pressed up against the tent, circling around the tent. Someone was definitely outside, walking around our tent, laughing. When they got to the front part of where the tent entrance was, they stopped. About five seconds went by before the person furiously shook the tent and screamed. That's when I knew my buddies were awake as well because Kyle screamed like a little girl right after. Whoever was behind the tent laughed and again walked off. We laid there the rest of the night, wide awake and definitely sober. We didn't want to move out of pure fear that whoever was out there was still there. When the sun came up, we packed up everything and walked back to our car. We still go camping every year, but this time we go to legit camping sites. I now bring a judge or a gun with me, and not just an axe. Whoever was outside our campsite could have easily been a deranged homeless person, psychopath serial killer, meth head, or just an asshole playing a prank on us. But I sure as hell won't camp in a rural place anymore. Stay safe out there. It's a dangerous world we live in. I grew up just north of New York City, living in a pretty densely populated metropolitan area. I always looked forward to the summer when my father and I went backpacking upstate. We had a spot about an hour north of Lake George in the Adirondacks and camped a few nights every summer. One trip, a few years back, we were driving to the trailhead on a long, narrow dirt road. We saw a car pulled over with a few people arguing outside the car. This isn't the most secluded spot in the world, so it is not uncommon to see another family. But it was weird that a car would be pulled over here with no real access to any trails. As we drove closer, 
a man walked over and waved at us. We assumed they were having car trouble. My father rode down his window. Suddenly, a female in the group screamed, Get away from him! The man suddenly had a serious face and began sprinting towards us. He was tall and well-built, and moving quickly. My father slammed on his brakes and quickly pulled the car into reverse. The man stopped and let out a sigh. We just sat there, parked, confused. The man reached towards us. We were a good ten or so yards away. Then he darted off the road into the woods. Cautiously at this point, we drove slowly to the parked car. There were three women crying. They were his sisters and apparently he had returned from home from the army a few months prior. According to the woman, shortly after he had begun acting odd and was diagnosed with PTSD as well as early onset Alzheimer's disease. The women got back into her car and headed for town. They said they were going to the ranger station to get help locating him. The rest of the day was fairly uneventful. We hiked to our campsite, fished for a bit and set up camp for the night. Sitting next to the fire, my father and I felt some strange vibes. We weren't sure whether the woman were telling us the truth or if the man was trying to ask for our help. And what was more disturbing was the fact that we were camping only a few miles away from where this man ran off. We weren't sure if he was violent, armed, or if he had followed us. Typically, my father and I slept in separate vivi tents, but we decided to stay in the shelter tonight. It was basically a small log cabin with three walls and an open front, where the fire pit was located. Neither of us slept too much that night. It probably just was my imagination, but I swear like I was being watched, though my father and I didn't hear footsteps or anything out of the ordinary. The next morning, I left the camp to take a leak. A few hundred feet away from our camp, I found a small fire pit right on the trail. I placed my hands on the ashes and they were soaked. Someone had a fire here very recently and poured water on it. We have food and supplies for four nights, but after I found that fire pit, we broke camp and left for the morning. In my town is a stretch of road down a valley along a river. It's a gorgeous drive, probably only 15 miles until it dead ends at a nature center where there's a lot of trails to hike, and people spend a whole weekend out there camping, fishing, and hunting. Cell service cuts off about halfway there, but I drive the road all the time. It's a good drive to take while infant naps in the car, and my toddler likes to look at all sorts of wildlife along the way. There are a few houses along the way, mostly tucked up into the side of the mountain hidden in the trees, but we usually pass a few people along the road for a jog or walking the dog. One morning, the baby falls asleep in the car, so we take a drive to the nature center and back looking for a moose or an eagle. It's about negative six Fahrenheit. The roads are kinda icy, but not too bad. We get to the dead end, turn around and head back towards town. When about a mile down the road, I see two people walking along the shoulder. Not unusual, it's a pretty morning. But as I got closer, one of them jumps out into the middle of the road frantically waving me down. I slam on my brakes, but with her in the middle of the road, and it's a bit slick out, I damn near slide onto her with my car. I finally get stopped. When they flagged me down, I thought one of them maybe had gotten hurt, with no cell service where we were, and they needed to get help. I cracked my window, and the two of them immediately ran up to my car. The guy hung back, behind my car in a blind spot, which immediately made me nervous. I couldn't get a good look at him, red flag number one, but the lady came up to my cracked window and said their car had broken down and they needed a ride into town. I hadn't passed a car parked along the road, and that was red flag number two. I explained that I had my kids in the car, so I had no room, nor was I comfortable having strangers in my car with my kids, which just made her mad. I offered to call a cab or an Uber but she refused those and then just started trying to open my door, which thankfully was still locked. The guy behind my car started yelling and cursing at me, so I just said sorry again and drove off. As soon as I drove far enough to get a cell signal, I called the non-emergency police line to let them know about the stranger hitchhikers. Turns out the police were looking for them because one of the homeowners along that road had found them sleeping in his car. They were trying to get back into town to disappear before the cops found them, but the cops didn't find them. I had kind of brushed it off, until a week later after watching the evening news, they were a featured story because they were a husband and wife, and he murdered her and then tried to frame it as if she had tripped and fallen down the stairs. There was not a doubt in my mind 
that if I had let them into my car or they had successfully forced their way in, he would have killed me too, just for my car. My husband and I used to travel for work. This story takes place seven or eight years ago. Our company had been fired from the gig we were on and we ended up staying in El Paso for a few days, waiting for the next gig to start. When we first arrived, we took a cab together somewhere. We talked to the cab driver for a bit, asking about the area. He started to say how nice it was, but we cut him off saying something along the lines of, we watched the news, how is it here really? He told us that we were pretty safe during the day but shouldn't walk around at night, and women shouldn't really walk around alone if they can help it. No problem, I was planning on sleeping as much as possible. Husband starts getting antsy after a day or two, and he decided to go for a hike. He's not exactly an athletic guy, so I tried to talk him out of it, but he assured me he wasn't going to do anything crazy and left. He came back a few hours later with a shopping bag. I rolled my eyes and laughed thinking he'd change his mind and decided to buy some video games instead. I was partly wrong. He called a cab and asked the driver to take him somewhere he could hike. The cab dropped him off near some foothills and he started walking. As he started to climb a hill, he noticed what looked like military men. They called to him and he went over. It was the National Guard. They started questioning him about what he was doing. He tried to explain that he was going for a hike, and they didn't seem to believe him at first. So he said, No really, I'm from out of town, I wanted to explore. I'm just going for a hike. They laughed and said, no you're not. They explained that if he had made it to the other side of the hill, he would have been in Mexico, and they were currently in some banditos having a gunfight. They asked him how he had gotten there, and hearing about the cab told him the driver was setting him up to be at least robbed, maybe kidnapped, or even killed. He concluded his story with, so I decided to go to Best Buy instead. Thanks National Guard guards for saving my husband, and cab driver, I hope you never drop anybody off in the woods for dead again. In July of 2015, my family and I took our motorhome out to Oregon slash California coast. We go here as much as we can and we hike the Redwood Forest Trails by Crescent City, California at least once a week. My friend went along with us on this trip. She and I decided to leave my husband and my in-laws to a quiet afternoon and take my rambunctious boys on a hiking trail. We were going to go on one we always did, but there were so many with people all around, we chose to take another one. As we were hiking, my kids were going up and back a bit, and I was scolding them about getting too far ahead of me and that they could fall and I needed to be closer to them. They would back up a bit and then do it again, much like any child. We had gone about a mile, passing people along the way, when we came to a bridge. There was a guy stopped at the end of it, and I don't know exactly what he was doing, but he gave me a weird feeling at first, but I collected my boys close to me as we came near. He just stared at us, without blinking. My friend came up behind us and happened to snap a faraway picture of our encounter. As we reached the end of the bridge, I had all my kids with me, and he was still just staring. Then he looked at me in the eye and said, You know a fun game to play here? I didn't really respond, but he answered anyway, Hide and seek. At that point, my friend caught up with us and heard it too. We both were very creeped out when we got to the earshot and we were just confused. But we did not want to double back and happen to meet him on our way back without weapons and my three young boys. We both picked up some sticks and decided to walk a bit further in hopes that he would come along with the group of people. My heart was racing. There isn't great cell service in the areas of this trail, though it is far from remote. When we happened along, more people turned up and turned around and we headed back with them. About a half mile up, we saw the same guy walking back the other way. We hauled ass out of there, staying with as many people as possible. At one time, there was a man on his cell phone talking about someone on the trail. My assumption that he was reporting the man, but then I already was creeped out, so I was just ready to leave the area. Ever since then, I googled to look for unsolved murders in that area, and I can't help it. We both just had that feeling, even before he talked. After he talked, I was sure that he wanted to hurt or kill us. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I believe in following those spidey sentences. <laughs> 